Hey friends, it is Wednesday and that means it's Ask a Flower Farmer. So it's Lisa Mason Ziegler here to join you for 30 minutes of helping, maybe, answer your questions if I can. And if you're new here with us today, this is how it works. If you have a question about growing cut flowers, seed starting, flower farming business, um, anything to do with that, even farm dogs, um, post your questions down below in the little bubble with the question mark. That way I don't perhaps miss your question by scrolling through with all the names that are listed here. So post your questions down there. Um, and while y'all are getting your questions ready for cool flowers, I'm sure, um, I have a lot of things to talk to you about. First off, have y'all heard that tomorrow night, which is Thursday Let's see, what is today, Suzanne? Today's the 28th, tomorrow's the 29th. So tomorrow, September 29th, I am doing a free webinar at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And friends, you've got to register to come. I am giving away over $2,000 worth of stuff and courses. You gotta attend live. And you can get to the registration through my profile. Um, just click on my profile, hit the link, and the very top one is um, starting a backyard flower farm from scratch is the webinar. And you can sign up there to join me tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And I just can't wait. Guess what's included? Guess what I have four to give away? My book, Cool Flowers, which has been out of stock everywhere now for like four weeks. <laughs> so we pulled these, you know, way back when, when this was all planned. So I have four Cool Flower books that will be given away tomorrow night. Three individually and one in the big grand prize that I will give away at the end of the webinar tomorrow night, which is like a thousand dollar value, friends. I'm so excited about this. I keep writing down things I want to remember to say you got for you guys. Um, so please sign up for the webinar tomorrow night. We already have thousands of people that are coming, and I just can't wait for y'all to be there. Secondly, I live on the coast of Virginia, and we, our hearts are just going out to all the people that are in the path of the hurricane. We have so many flower farmer friends and just people, but, you know, flower farmers that their whole operations are jeopardized over this. And with the hurricane, Ian, I think it is what I don't even watch the news, y'all. It's way too upsetting. Um, so, but I am thankful that as usual, I'm behind. Are you behind? <laughs> so we have not direct seeded. I'm so thankful for that because we're supposed to get like four days of pretty serious rain. Um, and our transplants could be planted, but they aren't. So I'm glad that they'll be safe and sound. I'll bring them all. They've been all been sitting outside, um, getting hardened off and being happy. They'll all be moved in um, Friday morning or maybe Thursday afternoon um, to spend until the first of next week inside, out of the wind. And um, so our hearts just go out to anybody um, that's in Florida. We're praying for you. And just forget your stuff and stay safe because they're really saying this is going to be a, a, an amazing water event. And that's where people die in hurricanes. Sorry, y'all. Shouldn't even have talked about it. Anyway, I have a lot of family down there, too. All right. So let's get on to some questions, friends. So if you have questions, I'll say it again. Um, just post them in the little bubble down below with the question mark. And then I will do my best to answer it for you. So here's a question. How long can sunflowers store in a cooler? I've been harvesting sunflowers since Monday for my farmer's market on Saturday. Well, you know, first off, you, you try to never have to sit on stuff, but sometimes it just happens, right? Um, the most important thing, especially with sunflowers, is their petals, once they start to open, will really get dehydrated. And that's, if you look at the sunflowers that are typically in supermarkets that are being shipped and not local um, and at florist shops, that's what's wrong with them. That's the part that makes them look so ooky is that their petals get shrivelly looking and that's from um, the humidity not being proper. And all, I cannot remember off the top of my head what the right humidity in a cooler is, but you should search engine that proper humidity for a floral cooler and make sure you have that because if that is correct, 
then you should be fine. Um, I would also have them in holding solution, not in flour food or just plain water. Holding solution has just enough um, nutrient in it to keep them green and to keep them fed, but not um, pushing them to open up, right? And I would guess that the optimal temperature would probably be about 36 degrees to keep them from opening more. Um, so that would be my take on that. And holding solution is what we use in the tea bags. You can learn more about it at the gardeners workshop. Dot com if you want to know what that is. Holding solution keeps the water clean, um, keeps the pH um, at the proper level, and provides just enough food to keep them happy, but it doesn't push them like regular flower food. So hopefully that'll help you. All right. So spicy sunnerol. That's cute. I'm having a hard time with coxcomb. Do I pinch or not pinch? These plants I pinched had lots of tennis ball sized blooms. The plants I did not pinch, pinch are huge, but on four to six inch stems. Can you talk about this? So first off, the one thing that everybody needs to understand about many plants and coxcomb or many varieties of plants, Coxcomb is a perfect example of this. There are single stem varieties of coxcomb and there are branching varieties of coxcomb. So that's the number one thing you have to figure out is which you have. If it's a single stem, you better not pinch it because it will do what you're talking about. Oftentimes, it'll send up multiple branches, but they'll be puny and short and not very happy. Um, but branching ones like Chief and Kurumi, um, Act, a bunch of those, um, Kramers, all of them are branching. Um, and so growing good coxcomb in general um, is really about, we start them all in soil blocks. And you know what I didn't tell you on the beginning of all this, y'all? Did y'all know that my course that only opens for once a year for five days and it opens October 1st, which is Saturday? for five days. I'm just saying my staff would kill me because I was going to forget to say that. So if you want to learn more from me and be connected into our community of amazing supporters, check out my course. You can find, learn about it over at thegardenersworkshop.com and come tomorrow night to the webinar. I'm giving away two courses, 600 bucks a piece, y'all. I'm giving away two courses plus a bunch of other stuff. So join me. Anyway, so, Celosia, the reason it made me think of it is that's one of the things that I cover in flower farming school. It's really the basics. I'm not going to teach you exactly how to grow coxcomb. I'm not going to teach you exactly how to get a customer. I'm going to teach you all the steps and then you apply it to your situation. Well, that's what I do about growing Celosia. I mean, first off, they do not like to be pot bound and root bound because they will stunt and just not, they'll be kind of puny. So we soil block them and plant them out when they're about four to six weeks old. Um, and Celosia needs full bacon sun, like eight to 10 hours at a minimum, nice fertile soil. We uh, use fertilizer um, when um, we're preparing the soil and then they like water, you know, even though they're very drought tolerant. So why yours one was good and one wasn't, I mean, who knows what that could be, but I will tell you that Celosias, if not um, if they get stunted during the transplant stage before you plant them, that can really cause a problem. Um, but I would check your variety would be the first thing that I would go to. All right. P.S. Mahogany Splendor, I did cut when woody. So there must be, there must be um, a question about that. Um, so Mahogany Splendor which is that amazing maroon foliage. It looks like Japanese maple leaves or cannabis, whichever you choose to describe it by. Um, and it's a great fall foliage, right? Um, and you do have to let the stems, I don't, mine don't, aren't woody, but the tips are pretty much developed. Um, and I will tell you that the last three weeks when Bobo's been cutting it, she left way more foliage on the stems than I thought she should. But guess what? 
the hydrated. And it's all about maturity. Um, so you just have to find what the maturity level is for your, and a lot of that can depend on the hydration level of the plant as well as the stage that it's in. Um, so not sure if that was the question, but we're doing it. In the soil block and nutrient, what is the ratio of organic green sand to rock phosphate? So if you're talking about the blocking mix nutrient that you get from us, it's 50-50. It's just like what the recipe calls for. It's 50% green sand and 50% um, rock phosphate powder, which is what can be hard to find sometimes. Um, Hunt Country. I don't know how to pronounce the name of that P-L-E-C-T-R-A-N-T-H-U-S. And I can't help you with that because I have never grown it. Um, I've seen it. It looks kind of like flamingo, Celosia flamingo feather, I think. Um, but I have never grown it. Do you know if the perennial scabiosis fama can be overwintered. I'm in 6B and I have never had a problem overwintering the annual variety. Um, Fama is my sister's favorite scabiosis. I mean, the blue and the white, oh my goodness, are they not beautiful? Um, but we, it de really depends on your conditions. And it's not so much your winter hardiness, it's the heat, humidity, and disease and drainage situation. Fama is a perennial, but that doesn't mean that it's a long-lived perennial and it may fall victim. Like Just like we grow delphiniums as hardy annuals down here in the south, but they are big-time perennials up north. It's because our July and August heat and humidity brings disease on and pests to them and kills them. So I can't answer that, but I would say that I do know people that have wintered it over. I'm not convinced that it is a long-lived perennial, meaning that it may winter over, but you may have not a really great rate of survival, which means you then have a bed that has one here, one over here, one up there, one over there, and that's torture, because what do you do with that bed? If you don't plant in all the other spots, you're going to have a weedy mess all season, and it's a way It's not going to let me fix it. Is that better now? Can y'all hear me? The flashing sign is now gone. Is it fixed? Okay. So, sorry y'all, I did not put my phone on Do Not Disturb and my sweet man called me and that throws Instagram into a total spaz case. Okay. So for that perennial scabiosis, I would try it, but don't count on it. Um, that's one of the things that as a home gardener, go for it. As a commercial grower, you would never put your eggs in all that basket, all your eggs in that basket, right? All right. Little Meadow Flower Farm had a pretty successful ye first year selling to our local florist. Congratulations. Any suggestions on how to do storefronts on or patio pots during the off season? How do I get those clients? Well, I, I can't give you any information on that because that's I have no clue. Um, I've not really done it, but I will tell you this. Keep your eye on whatever your real ball is. If you want to be a flower farmer and grow flowers, um, then there are, it's so easy to get distracted and get off your path 
and lose your morale and your momentum and even a lot of money because just like being a flower farmer is very specialized, meaning you need to have certain stuff and do things a certain way. Every market I did a hundred years ago, try to sell little potted plants at the farmer's market. I tried to sell transplants. Not only was it an enormous headache, but I didn't make any money and I would have been better off to have spent that energy ramping up my flower farming business um, in other ways, perhaps, or in a better way um, than to do that. So staying between the lanes, stay out of the ditches. And that's what I call kind of ping ponging around. And I understand about wanting to make extra cash, but I don't know that that always works out. You know, if you, you either have to go for it 100% or not. So, all right, let's see here. Mahogany, mine grew to over seven feet. I derailed, but they collapsed. Crowd, serious problem with hydration, boiling water, no cooler. So this is somebody asking about Mahogany Splendor. And I will tell you that, um, so our Mahogany Splendor also grows to about four or five feet. I mean, you do not need many plants of Mahogany Splendor. Um, it branches, I'd be willing to say 30 to 50 branches on one plant. Um, I plant it, we plant it close, um, but it still is producing a lot of stems, um, and I've never netted it. It didn't need, it's got very strong stems. So I just treat it like we do all of our other plants, planting it into a um, bed that's had just our standard organic dry fertilizer put in it. Too much fertilization can make it soft, I would guess. Um, so... And we, um, I would imagine that it does well in the cooler too. Little Hood Cottage Garden. Should daffodils in zone 6A be treated like tulips and pull with bulb or should they be cut above ground or if cut above ground, they'll bloom every year? All right, so that's a great question, which I'm not the bulb person. Um, that's Dave Dowling's area of expertise, but I can tell you this. Daffodils and narcissists are perennials. You do not treat them like a tulip. A tulip is a one-and-done bulb, and a, a daffodil or narcissus is a perennial, meaning you want to plant it not in your annual plant garden. You want to plant it somewhere where it can stay and multiply, and the bigger the bulb you buy, the more flowers and the bigger flowers you will actually get. And when you harvest them, I pull them. And it's just the one stem that the flower's on. We reach down at ground level and pull it. And that way you get additional stem. Um, and that is that would be about the limit of my knowledge because I refer to Dave Dowling on that. All right. Have you grown green trick dianthus? I saw at the grocery store and immediately ordered seeds. Um, I've never heard of Green Trick. Um, it's probably, I'll have to look it up now that you're saying that. Lane, did you hear that? I'll write it down. Green Trick is a green dianthus, apparently. Lane is our seed manager, so she's currently typing it into a search engine, I can promise you. Um, the only green I've ever seen was, I forget the name of it, but it was only available through plugs, um, and it was a patented um, variety, meaning you can't propagate it. Um, so, will I have not ever grown it, so, but we'll put it on our radar. But I will tell you this, we use the, all of the dianthus that we grow early. I cut them when I'm desperate for filler in very early spring because I grow two tons of Sweet William. I mean, there's a gazillion colors and several different varieties, and I grow them all, um, Cut it really early, it's green with no bloom. So it kind of is about the same, right? First and last frost, October and May. Do you include fall colors of Rudbeckia in your last warm seasonal annual planting? It is very successful. So I think you're asking me, do I include those dark colored Rudbeckias in my warm season tender annual planting next spring and a little bit later trying to get them to bloom we did i did do that this year and it did work i still but i didn't plant them late enough to have them planted but to have them blooming literally in late summer and fall 
they were blooming more in the middle of summer. Um, and I think it can be done. I just was too preoccupied doing 800 things. Um, so you would just have to really do some count and find out what the day from seed to bloom is and get them planted in plenty of time um, so that that would happen because that is the dream, right? To have Sahara and Cherokee sunset blooming in September. I mean, would be like a dream come true. But anyway, I haven't conquered that yet, but I did have it blooming in July and early August. So slowly but surely, I'm getting there. I'm having trouble getting good germination on calendula indoors. Is this one you put on mat for 24 hours, then move to a cool location. Um, we have we we're growing, we're growing um, four, I think, different varieties. All four of the, of the varieties that you'll see on our website. Um, that green heart, oh my goodness, it is amazing. Um, we're growing all four of them, and we had great germination. And they were on the sealant heat mat until I start saw a few cracking, and then I moved them over to the grow lights. Um, so. No, it's not the what you're referring to. That's not what we did. I'm not saying that might not work. For the webinar, are former students welcome to attend? Of course they are. Former students are always welcome to attend anything that I do. Tricks to get columbine and germinate. I do not grow columbine, um, and I have grown columbine, and it can be tricky. But it's not one of, it's not a crop. It has such an insignificant flower. I mean, if I was doing event work, maybe, that might be useful. But it's not something that I would grow as a production flower farmer. So, I'm sorry. I can't help you with that. All right, y'all. I'm trying to get through these questions here. Oh, Kim, I broke my hand three weeks ago and had surgery. Oh, I'm so sorry. I broke my toe. My big toe is broken in two places. Oh, stand by, y'all. Somebody, Sarah's here. Can somebody come get the door and the dog? Suzanne? So, I've got a broken toe. I dropped a huge roll of floral support netting um, on my toe. Anyway, I had not started soil blocks except for Dianthus Electron, which are beautiful. Is it too late for me to get started this week? First of all, no, it is not too late. So, for particularly for those of us that are in the South, which you're in the South like I am, our ground just never really gets frozen. So as long as you are starting the seeds and getting and having somebody prep your bed for you so that that's all ready and waiting, you're good to go. I mean, I have been known to start all through November um, seedlings to be planted in early January, you know, in a bad year. So um, go for it, Kim, and I'm so sorry you broke your hand. How do I get Campanula to germinate having a hard time? Yeah, Campanula, I mean, we only grow one variety of Campanula as a cool flower, and that's the Champion series. And it, in fact, is not a biennial. It is an, a hardy annual, um, meaning that you can plant it in the fall and it'll bloom in spring. Many Campanulas, most Campanulas in my experience, are actually biennials, and they're, um, they have to be planted much earlier than fall to get them to bloom next year. They need that vernalization period. Um, and I'll be real honest, I buy Campanula plugs. Um, I have started them from seed, but they're one of those challenging seeds. So I have to look it up, but that's what you need to find out the facts. Does it, should the seed be covered with soil or not? And what is the temperature? Um, and then try to tweak your situation to that. And I believe they're slow germinators, which is another problem, right? So be, so first off, ensure that you're doing the right steps and then just be patient. And you can order a Campanula right along with your Lysianthus if you're planting Lizzie in the fall. All right. Brooks Fresh Cut Flower Farm. Hi, Brooke. Thank you for your book that you sent to me. Hey, Lisa, would you be willing to speak on wreaths? How gr We grow beautiful evergreens on the farm. However, I have not figured out the cocktail to keep the leaves from drying out so quickly. Do you have any experience with this? I'm experimenting with different glycerin percentages. So, Brooke, um, I don't have any experience. I tell you who does, and you might be able to find something on their feed somewhere, is Sunny Meadows. Um, there are instructors for the hoop and greenhouse growing of cut flowers. They do tons of wreaths. And I think, hi Sarah, 
Um, I think that you shouldn't have to go to all those extra steps of glycerin. That sounds like a great expense. I mean, I don't know what kind of wreath. If you're just trying to make evergreen wreaths to sell, because people don't keep them. I mean, they want them up for the holidays and they ditch them, right? I believe that what makes the difference is when they're harvested. Like Christmas trees are cut so much sooner than we think they are because they're cut, I think, at a certain time when they're full of moisture. So that's what I would investigate. But I'm sorry, I know nothing about that. Pot marigold and dill sometimes don't make it through the zone seven winter, your experience. Yeah, so pot marigolds, which is calendula and dill, we're on the edge. I mean, on zone seven is definitely, if it's a really long, cold winter, um, you may not make it, but it is so worth trying it because you get the blooms. Calendula is one of the first flowers to bloom on our farm in the spring when it's fall planted. So to have that along with poppies and bachelor buttons, and I just want to say about bachelor buttons, friends, if you are not, have not experienced bachelor buttons, you definitely need to plant them. You don't need to plant a 100-foot row. Even with my operation these last few years of producing about less than 100 bouquets a week, we still only planted about five to seven feet of the different colors because you want to be able to cut it and cut it clean each week to keep it blooming because that blue color and the pink and the white, the mix is amazing. Um, so you need to plant um, bachelor buttons if you're not already doing it. But back to the question, pop marigolds and dill in general, I've never really lost them during the winter um, because I will give them a lightweight row cover when that bad weather comes, if in fact we get it. We don't always get it. That's the unpredictable part. So here is, can I winter sow in milk jugs, cool flowers now? I have absolutely no experience with the winter sowing in milk jugs, which is just a whole different method. Um, we actually direct sow straight out in the garden so they don't have to be transplanted. You know, it, that's just an add an extra step is the way that we see that. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. Peak petals, we, we have five days of rain coming up. Should I direct sow and hoop and cover my fall flowers? or just wait for the rain to pass. Um, I don't know where you are, but I we're waiting because it's gonna be a gully washer, it sounds like, and that is not a good scene. I mean, that first off, if we really get a lot of rain and it stands for any amount of time, you risk drowning your transplants and it will definitely wash away seeds that are sown. Yes, you can still plant bachelor buttons in 6B. Um, bachelor buttons are one of those really strong germinators. And, you know, bachelor buttons aren't just um, great for us for cut flower. I mean, who doesn't want a blue flower, right? You're not growing them to have a mass. They will pop up your bouquets in early spring like no other flower will. Um, but they're strong germinators, so I would try them. Which sunflower seeds come back true? And that's Jim asking from the UK. So Jim, um, we almost every sunflower I grow is a hybrid. I mean, because they're pollenless, um, and so that means that they've been hybridized, which means they don't really come back true to seed. You need to find some open pollinated varieties, but those typically are not good cut flowers. They produce pollen. Um, our sunflowers still produce tons of nectar for, for pollinators, but it doesn't produce pollen. Pollen kills vase life. So that's not to mention it drops it all over your customer's table. So you would need to investigate open pollinated varieties to have them reseed and come back true. Um, so sorry about that. All right, friends, we are knocking on one o'clock um, and All right, so I'm going to answer this while I was reading questions. I'm going to answer this one last question since it's related to cool flowers. My cool flowers are in the field. Do I need to fertilize? Great question. So cool flowers, when we plant, transplants and even the seeds, all of our beds are prepared with that dry organic fertilizer. And you can read more about our fertilizer. We sell it, it's packaged on our website, but it has all the information about what it is there. Um, and we apply it according to those directions. And so 
we put food in when we plant. Then through the winter, your plant's really not taking up a lot of food. We wouldn't even think about feeding again until the plants literally start growing in spring. When you start seeing growth start to happen, um, then it's optional. I'll be really honest, we don't. And it's because we just don't get to it. Our soil is pretty fertile. Um, you know, we soil test and verify that. And we add this general purpose dry organic fertilizer that feeds our soil, that then feeds our plants. And we're in such good shape, we just don't find that that's necessary. But you, if you wanted to do that, you would not fertilize until growth starts again in early spring. Friends, thank you so much for joining me here today. What you can do to help me um, the most is to invite your friends to come to this, share it um, with folks, and remember folks, meet me tomorrow night for the webinar, my free webinar, How to Start a Backyard Flower Farm. That's not exactly the name. What is the name of it, Lane? That's it. How to start a backyard flower farm from scratch, which is literally what I did, friends. And I still pretty much, although my backyard's gotten a little bit bigger, that's what I'm still doing today. And I am sharing my experience and I'm hoping to not just inspire you, but when you walk away to feel like you have got some pathways to follow to make your flower farm and dream come true. And then if that ain't enough, I'm giving away $2,000 worth of stuff, y'all. But you have to be present to win. And I will tell you that we have had an enormous response. And I have no idea if they limit the number of people that can get in. Um, it starts at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. You have to have the link. And the only way to get the link is you go to my profile here in Instagram. Click that link. And the very top option that will come up is to register for this webinar. Um, and we're friends, we're doing that. And it's, we're also going to be offering at that webinar an early bird special um, sign up for my course with a little extra bonus for signing up during the webinar. And I, we haven't ever done anything like this year. So how long we've been working on this, friends. And I'm so excited to have all that. They have lined up so much stuff for me to give away. And I just can't wait. And so I will see you tomorrow night, 7 p.m., tomorrow night, the 29th of September, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get the link by going to my profile, following the link, and requesting it. And I will see you there, and I hope I will be sending you one of the many giveaway things that I'm given. All right, folks, till we meet again, ciao.